And good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Vintage House Show, the best damn house show <laughs> out here. That's right. That's right. I've just added that. Um, you may be oh, mega yeah. with co host, uh, the lovely and talented DJ Lori Branch. Thank you. <laughs> we are honored, of course, uh, as we are every week, but we've got a great pairing of guests for tonight. Uh, we have DJ Tyrone Mix. Tyrone. Tyrone. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, mm -hmm. sir, and welcome. And we have Errol Easy E. James. What's also up, everyone? Hey, Errol, thanks for joining us. As no, thanks for having MB and all those things. Uh, the Vintage House Show is powered by the Modern Dance Music and Research and Archiving Foundation. It's the only show dedicated to the preservation of this genre known as house music. It is the premier show uh, in which we cover the history and the business. And sometimes we get into the issues of the day here on Vintage House. And again, um, Lori, who is a uh, co-host and uh, a great uh, journalist and, and co-host and, of course, talent, uh, has helped us along with our colleague, Lauren Lowry, who is not with us tonight, but she is also known as our super duper producer, exec producer of the show and the founder, co-founder of the Dance Music Research and Archiving Foundation. So uh, big props, there's a throwback term, uh, to <laughs> all the 90s. of us here on the show tonight. And we've got a great discussion. Uh, a lot of people have been asking, well, what's the connection with Tyrone and Errol? And um, Lori even uh, spent some time doing some research. Uh-oh. Oh, you know, you're in trouble when I start doing my research. <laughs> so, Lori, what did you find? That, that usually means I call Craig Loftus. Ah. <laughs> Friend and sometimes special host of the Vintage House show as well. Yeah, he's a maven. He's a house music maven. He kind of knows where a lot of the bodies are buried, and he's one of my buddies. So I said, <laughs> what's the deal, man? And uh, so you you can tell us what the deal is, and then then we'll get into our questions with our guests. So as uh, everyone who follows and watches the show, and of course our uh, students of the history of house music know, uh, the '70s and the '80s were very pivotal, uh, foundational years um, for all the things that began to influence the genre of of house music, and eventually gave birth to house music. Well, one of the things that you may not know is that there was this little bitty computer company um, <laughs> that was operating on the East Coast, uh, headquartered on the East Coast, but they were a global company called Digital Equipment Corporation. They were number two only to IBM, International Business Machines. This company was called Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, at the time, in the 80s or so, they probably employed, what would you say, Tyrone, about 30, 40,000 people? Oh, it, 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 they, they had uh, worldwide a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah. So, it, yeah, domestically, worldwide, yeah, maybe 40 and worldwide uh, upwards of 100,000. So this company was big and they were pioneers in uh, connecting people, much like we do um, today across various platforms, uh, but we had uh, the privilege of being part of a uh, connected group across all of these locations uh, called uh, Black Notes. And Digital, uh, again, was an early pioneer of this um, thing we call social networking today. And these two gentlemen, um, and, and sometimes along with myself, were staunch advocates for um, infusing the importance, um, the spirit, the, the passion of house music 
in this early forum known as Black Notes. And so I wanted to get a little reunion going here um, to talk about those pioneering conversations we had on, on Black Notes and more so what was the outgrowth of, of what these two uh, gentlemen and, and the uh, all the folks, shout out to all the DEC alumni, as we call them, that may be watching tonight. Um, but there was surely an outgrowth and a level of influence that each of these gentlemen had. And so um, we want to certainly spend some time understanding who they are. Uh, so Tyrone, we'll start with you. Where did you uh, grow up? Where did you attend high school, college, if college? Okay. Uh, I covered this so deeply when I was on Jesse's uh, podcast that I'm going to go really quick. <laughs> I was I was born uh, in a in an itty bitty town uh, called Barnum, Minnesota. It's about 40 miles south of Duluth or 150 miles north of the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Population less than 300 people. It was a consolidated school district, so my graduating class was 63 whole students. Wow. Um, wow. While I was there, I was the one man audio visual team uh, at the high school, which which contained grades seven through twelve. Um, during the summer months, uh, the two years before I graduated, uh, seventy two to seventy four, there was an outdoor church service that was being broadcast. Uh, over AM radio, and because I was hanging out, uh, I started doing the um, the remotes. I started engineering the remotes for this broadcast. So when I graduated, that station hired me as a, a an on air DJ. Um, of course, it was a go oh, I, I didn't say it was a gospel station. So, so um, here's your your future house music person playing. Uh, I don't know Percy Faith and and whatever uh, the, the Blackwoods Brothers. And I don't, you know, whatever. I don't find that unusual at all. We've oh. heard that story a lot. You know, gospel <laughs> to house. It happens. It happens. Right. Right. It's a journey. Except it, it wasn't a southern gospel. It was it was more European gospel. Oh wow! Now, see, that's, that's an interesting genre. <laughs> yes, but uh, and and then uh, I went to school uh, in Superior, Wisconsin, which is right across the bridge from Duluth. And after three years. Um, a person from digital came up to the school and offered me a job. And originally he said they had an opening in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And I went to Minneapolis for the interview. And the uh, after the interview, the, the district manager said, well, we're sorry to tell you that you're not a, a good fit for Milwaukee. We want you here in Minneapolis. And two weeks later, I was in Minneapolis. Uh, that was the summer of 77. And by the fall, I was DJing. My, my first ever gig, if you'll mm -hmm. call it that, at the gay 90s in Minneapolis. Were you getting paid, Tyrone? Yes, I was. Well, that's a gig. <laughs> <laughs> that's a paying it's gig. A, you, you get paid, that's a gig. <laughs> yeah, and, and I had and I had never I had never DJed before. Well you did you have two turntables? Yes I did. Oh. Yes I did. Um but the mixer in in two of the places I was at 
uh, yeah, I don't know if it was home built mixers, but it was very much like a broadcast mixer. So it had huge knobs. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was interesting. Uh, the, the main the main DJ there was a man by the name of Jerry Silvers. And I guess you would say I watched him, but he at that time he really didn't do a lot of of smooth mixes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was disco. We're talking '77 here, mm -hmm. so it still kind of started to fade out, and you would just bring up the next song. Um, so I was there for about half a year. Then I'm a new club opened up in St. Paul called the grand finale. I went there for about six months, uh, getting a better night because the, the, uh, the gay nineties was just a Wednesday night. Right. So now at the grand finale, I was doing Friday night, uh, the early shift, if you will. Hey, 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 just to clear the air, Wednesday nights are okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to interrupt Ty for a second. I will before I want you to stop before you get to Chicago because I want to, I want to, I want to uh, ask you a few questions before you get to Chicago. Okay. Yep, and yep. Uh, and then we'll we'll, we'll mm -hmm. bring in e, e easy. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ty. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, so then uh, another new club opened up across the street from the gay 90s in Minneapolis. And that was the new Sun Disco. So I was there about uh, three quarters of a year. And then Deck transferred me to Chicago. That was April of 1980. Okay. Okay. So, so we're going to park that there. Yep. Tyrone's arrival to Chicago and uh, Drum roll. bounce over <laughs> to DJ Aero Easy E James. Yay. Yeah. A 90s is still there, according to Vince. All right. It is. Huh? That's, that's good knowledge there, Mr. McFarlane. <laughs> so, so for me, my my origination my my start was about at the age of 13 when i started to actually do some dj and this was the time when originally i'm from brooklyn new york and so this was the time when hip hop was just starting to come into to to being you know we're talking about stuff like sugar hill gang and things like that so that's kind of what intrigued me. And one of the things that, that came up because of that was us being able to start DJing. And when I say us, I mean, um, when you're talking about New York and you're talking about New York in about 1979 and 1980, you're talking about DJ crews, okay? And so the interesting thing for me was, Laura, you asked if, if if Ty had two turntables, when I first started, I had one turntable. So I needed to recruit people in order to get mm -hmm. a set together in order to actually do DJ. So mm -hmm. that's where one of my boys, Gavin knows well, Calvin Spinny C. Gordon, he Spinney had the other Spinney. turntable. So one turntable plus the second turntable got us together um, and, you know, scoring up to get a mixer, then we were able to start DJ. Um, went to Brooklyn Tech, Brooklyn Technical High School, and a little bit opposite to what Ty said, our graduating class was somewhere around five, 600 at least. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more than that, because the school itself held easily 2,500 to 3,000 students. Wow. Yeah. It's one of the specialized high schools in New York. And so when we started to DJ, um, we did most of the high school parties. If you wanted, if you wanted the 
to write music, if you wanted, you know, you had Spinny C and Easy E both going up, cutting on the turntables, just similar that you would, you know, that you would hear in terms of New York hip hop at that particular time. And that kind of continued until I got to college. Um, City College of New York is where I went. And at that particular point in time, um, I was listening to not just at that time, just just hip hop. But um, one of the things that was interesting about hip hop is that you listen to all different types of music and you're really just trying to find a beat, the break beats from that. So that's how I started to get the love for um, your 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 disco, your euro, your your rock, your because anywhere you would be able to find those unique types of sounds, you were always looking for them. So that then started me into the the the, the euro, the disco, the that kind of of of, um, of genre, which mm-hmm. then started to introduce me into what ultimately became my love for for house music and um during the time within within college um one of the major places that that influenced my move towards um house music was of course by everybody's standard the paradise garage and so that was one of the main things that that really helped to ignite my my love for the genre, understanding how it kind of went from one place to another. When we talked about, you know, utilizing some of the the Euro disco hits, the classic disco hits, classic soul funk hits, um, all of that just blended together and and played all in one place at one time. It was just one of the most amazing things in my in, in my time. Long live Larry. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And so once I finally um, graduated college, I didn't quite yet have a job, but I had a summer internship. And the summer internship was at Digital Equipment Corporation. <laughs> um, I was recruited to go to um, Massachusetts. I'd never been there before in my life. And it was like, you know what? I don't have any other jobs. So let's let's go and figure out what's going on from there. And so that was that was my introduction to digital. And several months after finally getting into the state of Massachusetts is where where uh, Mr. Mega and I Mm -hmm. met up. Mr. Mega. Man, <laughs> <laughs> and and that unique that unique tie that unique blend of shy and nye of Chicago and New York fame, my boy MB. That's where that all kind of started. That's a great story. Uh, New York City, Paradise Garage. I mean, it goes deep. I'm jealous. I'm jealous too. I never experienced it. Kevin, did I you ever go either. to Paradise? I, I did not make it to the Paradise Garage. I know it's sort of like like people who say they never went to the uh, warehouse. My, I kind of feel like we're on that side of the fence, you know. Never went to the Paradise. We are. Yeah. Yeah. We were uh, what was a member there for was it in eighty five through eighty seven? So yeah, it was it was one of the best experiences and Mega, you you'll attest to this because a lot of the other clubs that have kind of spawned out from some of the workings and some of the things that that Larry put together at the Paradise Garage. I know some of that influence made it to to Chicago. Some of it continued on to some of the other clubs that you and I frequented while while you know going back and forth to New York. Sound factory, sound factory bar, those kinds of things. So it's really one of those things where um, I've never looked at it as one club versus another. I looked at it all as multiple experiences 
that gave you everything that you wanted to know about the total um, the the total spectrum of where house music is. I had I had to uh, make I had to throw a little controversy in there just for <laughs> who experienced both. You're so loving and and beautiful about it. He's like you know, it's there's no competition. I appreciate it, but I, I would love to hear from I've anybody. Been to the warehouse. I've Say been to the warehouse. I've so been so you can warehouse. talk about the Paradise Garage versus the warehouse. Oh yeah, well, absolutely. Well, well, absolutely. Well, tell, well, how did they differ? Um. I think part of the, part of the difference to, to to me, at least at the time when I went to the warehouse, was um, we're we're talking at the time when 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 you know tracks records, DJ International mm -hmm. Records, all of those labels were really starting to make an imprint mm -hmm. on on the on the world and. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the pride that was shown by just making sure that those those records like the the the, the jungle wounds the um marshall jeffersons the stuff mm -hmm. that um silk hurley used to do all mm -hmm. of that stuff always came out and it was like made sure that listen this is this is the stuff that 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 um this is where this is born out of a lot of the, the, the um, what we call the jacking house. So a lot of the acid house, some of the stuff that um, Tyree used to come out with. I mean, listening to that, it was really a lot of high, high energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Paradise Garage had that as well. But at the same time, you can see just based on the moods of, 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 when Larry was playing, he could he he can take you in a in a totally different direction and kind of bring you into Nirvana. So if you had to, if you someone said you had to choose one or the other, which one would you choose? I'm not going to choose one or the other. <laughs> I'm I like can paint you in the corner. And, I and like my cake, and I'm going to eat it too. Eat it too. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody else is watching and you experience the Paradise Garage and the warehouse, I'd love to hear your thoughts because that's not typically a story we talk about on Vintage House. We typically make the comparison between the warehouse and the music box. Yes. Because our our, our sort of you know parents were Frankie and. Ronnie when it comes Ronnie, to the origins of right. house music in those clubs. But I think you're right. I think that um, Reginald Davenport noted that the uh, Ministry of Sound in London was inspired by the garage. And so the yeah. garage, as well as the warehouse, inspired a, a lot of uh, clubs that sort of gone off from that. But if it's okay, oh, yeah. uh, Kevin, do you, do you mind if I um, if I bring Tyrone into this, uh, you know, about some of his experiences since, since we are talking about Sort of making that leap to Chicago Absolutely. And house music. Um, I asked you to, um, I asked you, Tyrone, to kind of stop where you got to Chicago. Right. Uh, and I know that uh, I know that I know a little bit about some of what I know. There was Rialto's. I know there was uh, there's a stop and drink. Now these are all clubs I experienced. So mm -hmm. I know you mm -hmm. did more on the South Side. So I'd love to hear about that. But where did you first land? In Chicago, what was the first club that you that you worked in in Chicago? Um, well, I did I did guest spots and uh, fill ins. You know, if a DJ called in sick or uh, just didn't show up, <laughs> which which happened. Where where uh, was that? So, first of all, I didn't I didn't start any DJing in Chicago until 83. Okay. I was, I was totally focused on the computer job. Um, so, but then in, in 83, uh, I started hanging out, uh, of course at, at the Rialto, but spinning, uh, on the South side at Martin's den, Ah. which was about what 56th in state. Oh yeah. I was uh, there. Sandy's. Oh, you were there. That Sandy, was you? Sandy's two. 
it well, was across the street from the projects, right? I don't remember that because it was nighttime, but it was next door to the laund. <laughs> it was next door to the laundromat. I was. I went to. Say, I went to both of. The, yeah. See, that was when we went out every single night of the week, Kevin. Okay. There was there was literally a party, and I think Tyrone was spinning at half of them. Seriously, like <laughs> there was Martin's Den, Sandy's. You and, know, yeah, all, all that was happening at the same time. Sandy's was eighty first and Cottage. Okay. And and then. Um, Oh, there's a there's a third club. I was asked many times to spin at the Jeffrey Pub. Yes. In, in fact, when I left the generator, they wanted to hire me, but their DJ booth was so small, and and I'm six foot six. Yes. And the ceiling in the booth was about five foot something. I remember that I DJed there too. Yes. It was small for me, and I'm five foot six. Right. So, <laughs> so I turned it down, um, and and uh, to be real, I'll be as quick about it as possible. So, in the spring of '95, I was tooling around the city. It was a Sunday afternoon, beautiful Sunday afternoon, on my motorcycle. Okay. And I stopped at uh, the Amen Corner 2, mm -hmm. which was owned by Willie, Willie Watson, mm -hmm. uh, who also owned Sandy's. Okay. So I went in there for a cold, uh, you know, Pepsi or whatever it was. And Willie and I were talking and he was playing one of my mixtapes. And in came a, a gentleman with a very heavy polish accent and he definitely he knew willie so the two of them were talking well i had just made a trip to poland i think it was either my third or fourth trip to poland so i started talking to this man and it turns out he owned the travel agency where i had purchased my tickets okay so we, you know, I mean, we were talking, uh, he was listening to the music and he asked Willie, he said, uh, you know, whose music is this? I'm looking for a DJ. And I, you know, Willie pointed at me and I, I said, well, that's, that's my mixtape. And he said, well, he had just fired a couple of DJs and he was looking for a DJ and a DJ manager. And he offered me the job. Nice. And where was this? Well, I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, I I assumed it was going to be somewhere out on Milwaukee Avenue. Okay. I, I mean, in in the Polish part of the city, that's what I assumed. What? So okay, go ahead. So after I accepted the job, I said, oh, "Okay, where is this?" And he said, "Oh, I thought you knew. I own the Rialto." Oh, okay. I knew that name was familiar. Yeah. Right. So, so to, and and for our audience, I don't know, Errol. Do you know uh, Rialto? Do you have you heard I of this? One? I, so, I have not. So, Rial so let me just tell you, Rialto was a a, a very smallish club on uh, downtown South Loop, right under the the train tracks mm -hmm. uh, on was that. Van Buren. Van Buren. 14, and, uh, 14 West Van yeah, Buren. 90, 98% men. It had a little back room where they wouldn't let girls go, but it was. The, <laughs> you but wouldn't the want men, to. <laughs> I, I was curious nonetheless. I went to Columbia College, so I, I lived down the street in an apartment. And we spent a lot of nights because I had my friends were gay men and they loved going. We were all kids, but, but we went up in Rialto as much as they would let us be. So you you got a job spinning there. It was also a, a forerunner to Walgreens and CVS drugstores. <laughs> Excuse me? I, I said, if anybody knows the Rialto, it was also a forerunner uh -huh. to CVS and Walgreens. How so? Drugstore. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, all the weed. You think for CVS? All the weed. Okay. And, <laughs> you know, that's where... The, Five o'clock hit, and and you know yes. people came out of the uh, out of their day jobs and ran in there to buy 
at that time, you know, a lid or a little bag. I know. I'm so square. We talked about this last week. I don't remember any of that. I just remember dancing. What's up? Dana Powell is, is, uh, is tuning in. Hey, Dana. Hey, Dana. He says across from what is now Washington. Harold Washington, Washington Library. Library. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Famous club. Go ahead, Ty. Uh, <clears throat> the Rialto, all the police officers were on the take. And, mm -hmm. and every payday, I don't remember if it was every week or every two weeks, but there would be a stack of envelopes about yay thick. Mm -hmm. And all day long, police officers would come in, get their envelope, you know, and leave. I, I mean, all the way up to, to the captains, you know, with, with the yellow and black stripes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, wow. So we we always got advance notice when there was going to be a bust. And and so as far as the employees, word went you know to all the employees, if you have drugs, which by the way, I'm a square too. I didn't I didn't do drugs. I wasn't that square. I mean I did oh, oh, okay. partake occasionally, but well, you know. I, I I not only didn't inhale, I mean I didn't breathe. <laughs> or whatever whatever the thing is. Okay. So it was like just make sure the employees that you have no drugs on you or behind the bar to protect the license. And and I kid you not, on one of the busts, uh, you know, everybody's emptying their pockets and throwing whatever they have on the floor. Mm -hmm. The police actually grabbed a trash can and a broom uh -oh. to sweep up everything that was on the floor. Uh, and and guys got busted in there for 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 hustling and and it was just it was you don't find places like that anymore. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, so that that's where I had my first residency. 95 to 90, excuse me, 85 to 86, uh, just a year. Uh, I was not the most popular person because they had fired two black DJs. And in fact, I was the first, I was the first white DJ to have a residency in any of Chicago's gay black bars. So that was also a little groundbreaking in itself. Yeah, you're pioneer. I, I, you said you were the first white DJ to have a residency in any gay black bars. Is that in, right? Chicago, in Chicago. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, at least that's that's something Michael Azabuku and I have talked about. And he's I'm, like, I'm yeah. waiting for somebody to challenge it. No one's yeah. challenged it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I believe you. <laughs> Well, that's, as I said, it, it came, Michael Esaguku and I have discussed it, and he, he can't think of, uh, of any. So, anywho, um, you know, I, I, when I started, we were still playing disco and Italo, and then, of course, then, of course, you know, house hit. I, did somebody say they had a question? Uh, no, you've just got a bit of an echo, but you're good. Oh, okay. So then, so then, you know, house hit, and and you had Jesse's record came out and Chippy, mm -hmm. and yeah, then yeah. it just blew up. I mean, it was, it was like disco for me. I, I just had my sixty fourth birthday last week, so I'm I'm the old fart here. Oh, happy so belated happy birthday! Happy belated! Happy belated! <laughs> so. Can, so I want to, can I make a, a, a link here? Um, Cause I want to pull easy e uh, back in, into the story, but I, I, I know that um, there were a couple, couple places that you went to after that. Uh, so tell us about Jim and Nick. Uh, this, this is, uh, I haven't investigated this yet. Okay. But somebody just told me today that they heard Jim had died. And Jim and Nick were the owners of? 
the stop and drink. Stop and drink. And did they recruit you from? Or, or stop and stab. Or stop and sniff and scratch. And <laughs> I, I, I remember. Right off Chicago. <laughs> yeah. So I, I heard from someone that that was a great bar, but it was kind of low and nasty. Is that a fair characterization? Very much so. <laughs> Very much so. Tell us about stop and drink. Um, it it was a uh, like the Rialto. It, it was a just a tavern. Okay. It, it was an old fashioned tavern. There was barely enough room. The bar was so big. It was a, in the center of of the place. So you just barely had room about two people wide all the way around the bar. And in the front was a packaged liquor section and a kitchen, which they no longer used. So they they did, uh, well, like I said, packaged liquor. Uh, there, there was a, the manager was gay. Uh, all the employees were black. Uh, at the, the bartender at, at, during the day was, was gay. The two bartenders at night were straight, but, uh, they were really cool guys. I mean, everybody, everybody got along. Um, there was never a big crowd in there. It, it was just someplace you went for a quick drink, maybe to escape all the, uh, you know, the, the crush of the Rialto and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, uh, I, I, after leaving the Rialto, I would hang out at the stop and drink. And at night they would play my tapes. Once again, it's, you know, uh, the manager would play my tapes and when they were played more people came in drank and stayed right and eventually i asked him i said you know what you're playing my music or or you know my 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 tapes can i bring my turntables down set them up in the package liquor section and spin from there Friday and Saturday nights free of charge. Hmm. Oh. I, I said, I'm, you know, I'm not worried about money. I just want to play the music. Mm -hmm. So I started that and immediately, you know, the, the place was so packed, you couldn't move. And eventually I became the manager at stop and drink. And I convinced Nick and Jim to tear out the package mm -hmm. liquor and put in a small dance floor. Mm -hmm. And what year was this time? Because because I I definitely spent some time at Stop and Drink. That was one of the many places we would we would frequent. Yeah, you know I'm really very bad on dates. I, I'm, I'm I admit that. I would but, say that's around 85, 86. No, 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 no. The dance floor went in about 90. Okay, so it was a little bit later. Yep. The dance floor oh, went yeah. about 90. And our last night was October 31st of 92. Hmm. So as I understand, uh, Jim, that you were very influential. Obviously, you convinced them to change the, the makeup of the club. And um, and just to kind of move our story, because this time is fleeting, yep. it, Jim and Nick, you 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 actually uh, convinced them to uh, create a club that was designed to your liking that we now know as as the Generator. Is that correct? Right. Um, somewhere somewhere in there, it, it, I would stand outside with Nick and Jim during the evenings and talk. You know, we we would just they they practically adopted me like a brother. I was a member of their family. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would go out to their house once a week. I think it was Monday nights and they would make a big dinner, big family dinner. Uh, <clears throat> so there were two pivotal conversations. 
one of them was they asked me, why aren't you spinning at one of the big clubs up north? And I said, because there aren't enough clubs. And, and you know, I'm not going to try and push anybody out of a job. Furthermore, I probably didn't think I was good enough anyway. Uh, and then a second conversation was when I told them that I had AIDS. By the time I got tested, it was full-blown, no T-cells. I mean, it was, you know, the, the real deal. So there was a third conversation, which they asked me, and they were, Jim, he cried a little bit when I told him I had AIDS, and, and they really were hurt. And they said, if we build you a big club, do you think you can fill it? And I told them, absolutely, absolutely I can. And so they said, well, we're going to make your dream of spinning in a big club. We're going to make that come true. And then it was about a month later, they gave me a choice of three locations. Uh, they had a real realtor that took them around the city. There was a place over by the original warehouse on Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And there were too many commercial businesses and condos in mm -hmm. the area wasn't crazy about that then they brought me down to i think it was the plumbers union building mm -hmm. which is the end of randolph at seven corners there i know randolph ogden yeah whatever i wasn't crazy about that building because it was all concrete mm-hmm and then they brought me to 306 North Halstead. And all they had to do was open up the garage door. And I said, this is it. <laughs> this is it. And they, they let me design it. They wanted to make it very bougie. I mean, I mean, they wanted a bougie club. Kind of, kind of like what the mid turned out to be. Hmm. In, in terms of, but I wanted it as, as an homage, more of an homage to Robert Williams and Frankie. Yeah, uh, it definitely had that feel. I know Ty, I went there right shortly after it was opened and that was the first thing I felt like. When I yeah. walked in I, and I was with a friend who was much younger than me and I said to her, listen, this is similar to the experience that I used to tell you about at the warehouse, like it had a very similar vibe. And it was That's, the closest thing that I could could relate it to, you know, uh, when, when I was described, I was like, the generator is the closest thing. So I feel you, you, you guys accomplished that. I will try to get this out in 30 seconds. The name, where did the name come from? I wanted something that was similar to warehouse powerhouse mm -hmm. and power plant and i was getting i was getting my hair done at uh, <laughs> jonathan blackwell's uh he was because i was not a natural blonde oh no <laughs> <laughs> but so so i'm i'm there you know getting my hair bleached and I, I said, you know, we're going to open a new club and I can't figure out a new name. So we started brainstorming. The only thing I could think of was was power line. Okay. And I really didn't. Yeah. You know, it, it was right, but I didn't care for it. And he said, how about the generator? And once again, it was Jonathan. That's it. That's it. That's great. So, so I owe the name to Jonathan Blackwell. And you were there for, for quite a while. No, I, I, no, I wasn't. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I know you, you okay. Let's, well, let, let's just say we opened Memorial Day 1993. Yes. And I had a boyfriend who Nick and Jim did not get along with. And I'll, I'll simply say that 
Christmas morning, 1995, uh, whatever it was, six o'clock in the morning, because I think it was a Saturday, uh, Sunday, Christmas morning, they called me back to the club and uh, standing there right there in front of the bass speakers, Nick was standing there and he said, uh, you're fired. Um, they, they said, we told you we weren't going to deal with you and your boyfriend again, that he was causing problems in the club. What was he doing? He was, he, he was kind of a, a Cause problem a poop starter. <laughs> he was causing problems in the club. We're, we're not FCC regulated here. You, okay. <laughs> he was a shit starter. Yeah. <laughs> and he did not get along uh -huh. with the other bartenders. Okay. And, and <clears throat> so anyway, you know, there, there's, I'm leaving out a whole lot of story. I know. I know. But, we always, we always <laughs> leave out a lot so we can come back and fill in the, fill in the gaps. Right. right. But you right. had to talk about your birthday party there at the generator. Oh, it was. I'm, I'm assuming Nick and Jim had already decided that I was going to be fired. Excuse me, mm -hmm. excuse me. No problem, Errol. Did you ever get a chance to uh, check out the generator in Chicago? Did not, did no? not get to check out the generator. Okay. Oh, that's you would have liked it. It would have yeah. been. It would have reminded you of <clears throat> that spirit from like you know, yeah from the garage. Awesome. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, um, what did you ask me? Yeah, uh, we were talking about that infamous birthday party. I oh, mean, yes, yes. 95 or so? Yep, it, uh, November of 95. So it was, you know, slightly more than a month before they fired me. Um, and so, so you had a two year, almost a two year run there. That's that's not yeah, a, a little, not little a short amount of time. Yeah. Uh, <sighs> Most clubs don't last two years. You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to bear my soul here. When Nick said that I was fired, I got down on my hands and knees and I cried on his, I mean, I was crying on his shoes. That is not a lie. That is the honest truth. I was begging them. And they said, no, they said, he's causing problems. We told you we're not going to deal with it again. And uh, they wouldn't even let me go past the speakers, the, the base. The, um, the next day they had, every, they had the sound system that was in the club was mine. Okay. And so the next day, uh, Monday, December twenty sixth, they moved. They moved. In, they moved out. Like all the records that were there, those were all mine. That was my next question. Yeah. Right. So they moved out the, and it was a primo record collection. Those were all the good ones. Uh, and I had all the crap records underneath the DJ booth. So they moved out everything. They hired a, a moving van. And uh, by Monday afternoon, I had all the speakers and everything in my apart in my loft. And uh, they had put in, I, I believe, matching, uh, matching equipment. Um, <clears throat> so Dana, who was my my second in command, he took over as the, the club manager and the DJ manager. And, um, you know, he, he was a manager for a while. And then Eddie Watson became the club manager. And I think, I think they, they ran the show up until 1999. Hmm. Uh, if Dana's online, he can, he can fill that in. Yep, Dana, Dana's been uh, filling the gaps in yeah. as, as we moved along. Tyrone, one, one uh, Reggie Davenport has a asked us a question. Uh, you know, there's so much you, you just unpacked, and I, I would love to explore more 
with you <clears throat> such a short amount of time. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Easy uh, told his his someone in his family, look, I got an hour. So I'm hoping we might be able to squeeze a little bit more time out of you uh, so we can get, get your story I, in here. There is um, one story left I would yeah, like to I, tell. So when, oh yeah, whenever. we got, we yes, we, we got, we got, we got a little time, but it, any of the signature tracks that you remember at the generator, just for those folks who, who never experienced that? You know, I, I didn't have, any signature tracks. Yeah. I, ha I had a reputation for playing the newest music in the city. Mm -hmm. And every weekend, there were other DJs from the city and, and people that became future DJs. Uh, they were down there with their little pencils and, and pieces of paper and... <laughs> running up to the DJ booth. Now, I didn't believe, I didn't believe in covering, you know, covering the label so people sure, couldn't sure. I wanted people to know what I was playing. Yeah. Because I was selling it at the same time. You call it the education, the DJ teaching. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we, I never know. Do, did DJs ever do that? I mean, I, I've never never wanted to tell people what I'm spinning. You know? Like people will, will come up and say, what is that? And I'm, I'm happy to share it with them. You know, I guess, I guess that's a thing. I don't know about that. Easy. Yeah, blackout labels was a thing. Dude, blackout. Oh, blackout. I know Chippy yeah. talked yeah. about that. I, yeah. I hated people that did that. <laughs> All right. So listen, I know you got one more story, but yeah. Kevin, I know you've, you've been dying to, to get easy back and then, but I want to unpack a lot of that. I'm, Ty. I'm you, sorry. You mentioned, I'm sorry. No, I, trust me. Mm -hmm. Don't apologize because we never have enough time. So, which means we'll have to have a part two. But I do want to. I do want to circle back to you. At, you know, in a little bit about about what you said about AIDS. You know, it's something that we don't talk a lot about on this show, but it's such a huge part of house music history. You know, what what happened when people were diagnosed with AIDS? what happened, you know, people that we lost, people whose careers were affected by it. But I, I wanna get I wanna I wanna go uh, back to that and uh and let Kevin get get easy back back in here in this conversation. And and so we'll um simply segue on that um question of you know there this genre was built by um a lot of people who came in not necessarily uh as artists, but they became artists. Their craft, their artistry uh, was part of the house story, is part of the house story and has elevated the genre. And so I wanted to go to you, Errol, and ask you about, um, you know, you started name dropping on, um, you know, some of the Chicago uh, creators that uh, influenced you. Uh, I think I heard you mention Steve So Curly, uh, Tyree Cooper, who, um, you know, both of those gentlemen, friends of the show. Um, so who are some of the other uh, people that have really enlightened um, your appetite, if you will, for for house music and, and talk about why? Well, what, one of the things that that was so unique about it was that, as you as you mentioned, Kevin, a lot of a lot of what was going on at the time when house was starting to break, it was just it was just DJs just kind of going to the next level, right? In terms of just kind of figuring out what to do with you know some equipment that they might get, you know that little four second sampler, what can we do to, to be able to make things kind of work? And, you know, one of the ones like during, during like the heyday, and when I say heyday, when, when, we, when I graduated from, from college and moved to Massachusetts, and I think Kevin, you can probably to attest to some of this, the, the house music scene that was there was kind of something that had to be um, nourished. It had to. It had to be grown. It had to be um, developed. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that that kind of helped to do that was just the combination of being able to 
um, do parties where we had two turntables or two DJ setups, maybe even a keyboard and drum machine set up to be able to do some custom custom beats, custom music that that you know we might have been putting together. Um, just kind of on the whim, maybe like on a Thursday night for a Saturday party. So who, um, who did you see do this or was this just your innovation or was there, you know, someone in particular that you saw, um, you know, cultivating this sort of live performance uh, combination DJ? <laughs> Um, I think some of that was, and I, I've got to kind of go back in, in the memories, but um, one of the people that I, I, I remember that was kind of doing those kinds of things um, was the likes of your Chicago's DJ Fast Daddy, right? He, he, was, he was a DJ DJ, right? Almost yeah. to, the, to the point where he was kind of blending from a lot of what was going on once again with with with, with hip hop and things like that and made himself into, go ahead and, and made himself into someone that was doing um a lot to move the needle for for house music in general and so when i started to kind of understand what some of that was it was like you know what I, I I think that it's not just about what you can put onto the, the, the turntables, but what what you can do kind of um, impromptu, which is one of the things that started to really start, you know, kind of um, take off where it was like, hey, th this isn't even out or around yet in terms of beats or in terms of new tracks that are kind of coming coming around. But they're blending in with the things that you know. So sometimes you're not even sure whether or not it's it's something that's already on wax or something that's kind of just being played with or toyed with. That that's that was one of the things that that really, really started my interest in trying to do my own kind of, um, you know, production, drum machines, just just that kind of thing. And so where where are things today? For DJ Easy E, in terms um, so one of, of music production, DJing, what are you doing these days? One of the things that I'm really doing now is actually, you know, I I, I kind of call it helping the next generation because I'm doing a lot of mentorship with um, with teenagers, whether it be remotely or directly, with helping them with with music composition, just learning a little bit more about um, how to put together music, how to make it, um, I won't necessarily say radio commercially, but being able to take your feelings and what you're, what you're gravitating to and actually putting it down on, on tracks and helping them with arrangements, um, compositions and those kinds of things. And, 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 and they love it because it gives them a way to kind of feedback and use their creative sense to, um, to, to move on and, and, and learn a lot more about. And it's not necessarily just for house music, although the passion is there for house music as well. It's for whatever they feel that, that they want to bring out of themselves internally. That's great. That's, that's great that you do that, yeah. Yeah, we, we talk uh, on occasion about the secession planning, the, the preparation of the next generation uh, to be able to carry forth um, you know, the the passion that we all have for uh, this genre, because, you know, a lot of us are are up there. Tyrone, you're you're uh, certainly uh, well uh, into the time spent with the genre, uh, but so are many of the rest of us. And um, I don't know about you. I'm just getting started. I'm not sure what. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lori is uh, okay. burning things up with a uh, crew called the Good Girls. She's That's right, host, Good Girls. Okay. Uh, the Vintage House Show. Um, she's done some great sets after these shows, and and so 
we appreciate everyone that tunes in to the Vintage House Show every Wednesday night, uh, nine o'clock Central Time. Uh, we've been thrilled to have both Tyrone Mix and Arrow Easy E James uh, joining us. And of course, they have so much more uh, to talk about. And, and Lori, you were going to spend some time with um, Tyrone on um, on one of the questions that yeah. emerged from his last response there. Well, I know you got and you got at least one more story in you. You know, we're 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 gonna we're we're at the ten o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. We're at nine, eight o'clock for you anyway. We're at the top of the hour, yeah. uh, so I don't want to <laughs> take up too much more of your time. You gentlemen been very generous, but I did want to kind of circle back to to something you said uh, when you just you know were bold enough to say that when you were diagnosed with AIDS, and I appreciate you sharing that. I think that uh, even in 20, many people in the community are still very closeted about their own status. Um, and I, 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 as a, you know, I've got many hats, but m some of you may know that my day job have, for, the, for many years has been to, to work in the AIDS field, you know, working um, in prevention and care and housing and in an administrative role. And, and now uh, with, with the company that I work for, with Gilead, um, but I just feel like there's so much to talk about. There's so many, the reason, you know, that I do this work, that I work in the gay community and with gay men, uh, you know, is, a, is because of AIDS, because of the way it touched my life in the 80s, the number of people that I lost. Um, uh, I, our friend Dana Powell just, you know, put a post, he said, you know, somewhere around 80% of the people who worked at the warehouse are, are gone, you know. I could say that for, for all of the friends that I hung out with who went there with me, many of them are gone. Um, so T Tyrone, I, I, I know we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I do want to ask if you might come back and we have a longer discussion, maybe around World AIDS Day, about really what it meant for AIDS to impact the house community. You know, and yeah. if you want to say something to it now briefly, feel free to do so. Well, uh, anybody that was there when I was there would remember that at the end of the night, uh, I would usually say that, uh, according to the city health officials, one third of gay black men in the city were infected with HIV. So I said, look to who is standing to the left of you or to the right of you. I said, one of you might be infected. So grab those condoms and be safe. And Nick and Jim hated that I did that. Mm -hmm. they, to they told me that. Mm -hmm. They said that, you that you're ending the night on a downer. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, but to me, it's important. Mm -hmm. And you, you, the only signature song I had was the last song of the night, which was always Dr. Feel Good. Oh, how about that? Thanks for bringing that up. And I think, Easy, you know, uh, Larry Levan, someone mentioned, you know, please say his name. Uh, uh, Larry Levan from Paradise Garage was taken too soon. There were so many, so many of oh, our. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. him, you want us to comment? Frankie, please? him, Frankie, just, there's just so many of them. And, and it's, it's, the thing that, that I think helps sometimes is the fact that the recordings that we have to remember all these folks by is one of the key things that, you know, it brings us not just back to those days, but to the people that have helped to create what we have for today. So it will live on forever. It will live Absolutely. on forever because of that. Right. Yeah. Well, I think we'll do we'll do something special. World AIDS Day is coming up, uh, December first. Every year is World AIDS Day, and maybe we can um, you know have a, have a little deeper conversation about that, and and maybe do some tribute. So, uh, Kevin, I know that uh, this is your show tonight, and I've kind of stumped all over it. So forgive me for that. Um, this is our show. This is what happens when you put me on? You know, the, the philosophical group. Bad idea. 
<laughs> yeah, the Philosophical Grooves edition is just an opportunity as we wrap the show to certainly get a little philosophical with our guest, uh, particularly as, you know, the world is a totally different place than it uh, certainly was when we started uh, in all of our pursuits of, of yeah. musical nirvana, to quote you, Errol, uh, as you said. And so as we look at the world today, if you were um, able to be um, able to return to the world with a conscious and a memory of what the world was when you left it, what would you want to bring forward from a nostalgic standpoint versus what would you want to leave behind about the world? Not necessarily your personal life, but what you've experienced, what you've observed in, in the world. So uh, this is sort of a, um, a story or a question um, that you can, you can tell about reincarnation. If you were to be reincarnated, <laughs> how much of what you know about the world today would you bring back into that new life? Go, Errol. Oh, you that's deep. Man, <laughs> that's, that's, deep. that's too deep. That, that is deep. deep. I, 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 I had to take Errol. note during that question. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I, I think part of that comes down to, um, and, and I don't know if I'm going to answer it the way that you've actually asked it because I'm still, it's still kind of rattling around in my head, but. <sighs> If I if if I were to come back reincarnated, I would hope that there is a lot more love and understanding in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that we've back in the day, you probably saw a lot more of that. And I think that I'm going to just leave it at that. I think a lot more love. And a lot more in this day. Amen. Like I drop. DJ Purple likes the question and the response. Tyrone, over yes, to sir. you, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm thrilled to and is to be part of the archives now uh, mm -hmm. to answer the question. I think Errol has it. He has it correct. Right now, there's not only in the United States, but worldwide, there is there's a sickness, uh, there's an evil that's happening. Uh, there's there's rampant hate everywhere. Um, so, you know, as as, as a Christian. You simply you look forward to the promised uh, afterlife because we, what what we all seek is heaven. That another mic drop? That that's another. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're dropping two mics. You you guys um, definitely rose to the challenge of tonight's philosophical group. Okay. Um, okay, real deep. And, and again, Lori, you brought um, an elevated uh, vibe tonight. Okay. Um, I try to do it next week. I can't guarantee. And a smile. You have a smile, girl. Oh, 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 I love a beautiful you. smile. Blowing up. Hey, Lori. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so we want to leave everyone tonight with those expressions, positive expressions yes. of you know, aspiration to um, be more loving, more caring and compassionate for uh, humanity, um, to help one another really get to uh, that next life of, of love that is endless and ever uh, infinite. And so we only here at Vintage House only serve to uh, at least share these important stories, share these perspectives from you know individuals who contributed and impacted and influenced uh, this genre of house music. 
And so for those of you who participate in, in tonight's show, we thank you. Um, we're back next Wednesday, nine o'clock on the Vintage House on WNUR 89.3 FM um, page, Lori Branch's page, Kevin McFall's page. Uh, we're also available on YouTube uh, sometimes at the djchannel.com. <laughs> so yeah. check us out, vintagehouseshow.com for past episodes. You can download uh, wherever your favorite podcasts can be found. We're there with you. This is the Vintage House Show, your main man, Mega, and... And the rest of us. Lori, Thank you. Peace and happiness. <laughs> Co-host Lori Branch, Tyrone Mix, Arrow, Easy E. James. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Be Thank well. You guys. Stay Salute. safe, everyone. And good night. Peace. Good night, everybody. Good night.